Greetings and welcome to the introduction to physical science. In this lecture, we are going to begin our discussion of optics and we are going to look at two things. We are going to look at reflection, which happens when light hits a mirror and refraction, which happens when light passes through a lens uh, or something similar. So these are two basic types of optics and can be used to form actually to form images as we'll look at in the next couple of lectures. So let's go ahead and get started here. And first of all, we want to look at light and light can be described as a ray because it travels in straight lines. So we see light doing things like casting shadows as it as it hits things. So in the image here, we would have light passing through and could pass through a window, but it always follows straight lines, meaning that it will not curve around things in general, uh, at least on this kind of scale. So what we do not see when we're looking at everyday objects is what we call the wave nature of light. Light does behave as a wave and can diffract around things as well. But for right now, we're looking at light as rays that always travel in straight lines. So we will see that, for example, when something casts a shadow, uh, that the, the light cannot pass through it. So if you put an object out in the sunlight, it will not be able to pass through that. And we will see an, a shadow opposite to the direction the sun is in the sky. And what we're going to be looking at over the next couple uh, lessons is what we call geometric optics. That's the optics uh, of geometry. So we can use that and use the fact that it has that light travels in straight lines to be understand how it changes directions when it interacts with matter. So when it strikes a mirror, when it's dry, when it goes through a, a lens or something similar, the direction will change. And that's what we want to try to start understanding in this lecture. So let's go ahead and look first of all at the law of reflection. So when things are reflected off a surface, uh, what we want to look at first is what happens. Well, the incident ray comes in, strikes the surface and then bounces off. But it just doesn't bounce off randomly off a nice smooth surface like this. There is an exact pattern to how it reflects. And first the thing we have to look at is how do we measure these angles? Well, angles are measured from the perpendicular. So you imagine a perpendicular line against, say, in this case, a mirror. And you measure the angle of the incident ray here from that perpendicular and you measure the angle of the reflected ray here again from the perpendicular. So not from the surface itself, but from that perpendicular ray. And that will then give us the two angles that will give us an angle of incidence, the angle coming in and the angle of reflection. And we're going to find out jumping ahead here that the law of reflection tells us that these two angles are always equal. So when a ray comes in and strikes off of a surface, the angle at which it strikes will always be the angle at which it is reflected. Now there are some differences uh, in what we see based on the type of material there. So if we are looking at a very rough surface, for example, in that case, rays are reflected in all directions. So they're reflected all over the place and the light is then diffused. So we have the flashlight shining in here. This is not a nice smooth surface. So while angle of incidence will always be equal, it is uh, reflected in different ways because the surface is angled in different directions on a rough surface. So light will be going to a person looking here, here and here. And if we look at a the other example, if we look at the example of a very smooth surface, then we can see that it's a little bit different. In this case, everything comes in together and we do not see the light is coming straight here and a person here sees the light, but a person here sees no light. Now we see this in terms of scattering. Uh, one good example of this is when you're driving, especially at night, when the road is rough, then the light comes off and reflects in all directions and you can see the road much better. 
If you've driven on a night where the road is wet, it is a much smoother surface and you're not able to see as well because the light is then bouncing off all in the same direction away from your vehicle. So you do not see near as well as you do when the light is scattered all over the place. So it is better at illuminating things and the, off the rough surface of the road than it is off a much smoother surface when the road is wet. So let's now look at the law of refraction when things pass through materials that change. So we're looking at variations in matter. So it could be something going from water to air or air to water. In that case, there are going to be changes in the speed of the light. So remember, we know C is the speed of light in a vacuum. This is different when light passes through other objects. It will be slower passing through air and even slower passing through water. So the light is actually also because of this the light will change directions as it passes through different materials. And that can in some case give us multiple images of an object and we see that here. When we look at this fish tank light from the fish here actually the fish that is there can travel out in this direction be bent at the interface between water and air and come to our eye from this direction. And that would give us one image of the fish off to the left. However, light traveling this way is bent and comes to our eye from another direction, giving us a second image of the fish off to the right. Now in reality, we know there is only one fish right here. But because we see this, we see because of the way the light bends as its velocity changes, as it goes from one type of material to another, we can actually get multiple images of the single fish in the tank here. So. What does this mean? And one of the things this means, you want to take a little aside here and look at the speed of light. How do we measure something? We know that the speed of light given by C is about 300,000 kilometers per second. So extremely fast and it was not something that was easy to measure. Galileo tried to measure this by looking at light on different hilltop, distant hilltops, lights there, and was unable to get anything more than that it traveled extremely fast. That was all that we knew. Light did travel extremely fast, but that we did know that it tra how we couldn't have an idea of how fast it traveled yet. Now earlier on Romer later was able to measure a speed of light using the moons of Jupiter and timing their eclipses and that gave light speed with about a 25 percent error. So definitely not a great measurement but starting to pin down the light pin down the speed of light. And then finally in the late 1800s Michelson was able to measure the uh, using rotating mirrors was able to measure the speed of light and a stationary mirror 35 kilometers away. So cut down here light would be shown on this rotating mirror that with an octagonal pattern eight sides and that light would then travel off down a long path to a stationary mirror be reflected back and then strike the mirror. And depending on the exact pattern, you could then see it here. Depending on how fast the mirror was rotating, you could get light patterns to be able to interfere with each other and allow you to measure a much more accurate speed of light. And in this case, we had a much better value of 0.04% error. And we now know accurately the speed of light C is given to many decimal decimal places 2.9979245 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So we now have it measured much more accurately. But it's taken us a long time because speed the speed of light is so large and it is not something that is very quick. In fact, that is very slow. It does take even just a few seconds for light to travel to the moon and back. So traveling a very large distance like that that takes us several days if we were to send a spaceship there takes light only a couple of seconds. So that's why it took us so long to be able to measure this. Now, 
The other thing we next thing we want to talk about here is what is called the index of refraction. So we are back to talking about refracting uh, materials. And what we want to note is that the speed of light through a material is going to be less than the speed of light in a vacuum. Remember, the speed of light in a vacuum is nature's speed limit. You cannot travel faster than that. So traveling through any other material will actually slow down the light a little bit. And we measure that by what is called the index of refraction. The index of refraction is equal to the speed of light divided by the velocity in that material. And that's always going to be greater than one. Remember, this always has to be a smaller number than C. So C will be bigger. If we have the bigger number in the numerator, smaller number in the denominator, everything will always be greater than one. And the larger this is, the more light slows down traveling through that material. So if we have a very large index of refraction, like a diamond at 2.419, light slows down quite a bit. If we have a smaller index of refraction like air at 1.000293, then it's much less slowed down, but it is still traveling a little bit slower than it would be in a vacuum. Now we can go ahead and do an example calculation with this. And let's look at the example. In this case, what we're going to do, we want to find the speed of light in zircon. Zircon is a material that is used in jewelry to, to imitate diamond. And we see here, we can pull up table 25.1 in our textbook and see what the index of refraction of zircon is. Note that it's a little bit less than that of diamond that I talked about previously. So it's 1.923. And that again is the ratio of the velocity to the speed of light. So now we know the index of refraction. We always know the speed of light. So what we're trying to find is the velocity. So we can solve our equation for velocity, that velocity is equal to the speed of light divided by the index of refraction given here. And since we know those, we can then put in the numbers that we need. And the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Divide that by 1.923, the index of refraction of zircon. And we get the speed of light is 1.56 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Much slower, about half the speed of light in a vacuum. So if traveling through zircon slows light down by a factor of nearly 2. In this case, a factor of 1.923. That would be the speed. That's how fast light is traveling through this material. So light can be slowed down quite a bit by other materials. Remember that it is 3 times 10 to the 8th is the speed of light in a vacuum. Now let's look at what we learn for the law of refraction. We had the law of reflection that the angle of incidence was equal to the angle of reflection. Here we know that light rays change direction when they pass from one medium to another. So we can look at the example here, not with light, but with a uh, lawnmower passing from the sidewalk onto, say, a thicker grass, and it slows down. You're moving faster here. You hit the grass, and it slows down. Well, that is going to turn here. Again, we measure angles from the perpendicular to the surface. So the first angle is the angle at which it is incident, that it is striking the material, and then the angle of refraction, again, measured from the perpendicular. Now, in this case, when you go from a material, we see that it will slow. When we go from a material that is less dense, the sidewalk with no grass to cut, to the denser area, then things slow down. As it slows down, it will move closer to the perpendicular. So note how the ray was further away from the perpendicular here. It turns and will come closer to the perpendicular when it slows down. So the lawnmower slows down. It will move towards the perpendicular. The opposite occurs when it speeds up. When it speeds up, it will move away from the perpendicular. So again, we have our perpendicular line here. As the lawnmower is coming from the grass, it has one angle, an angle uh, at which it is incident. And then the angle of refraction is now much larger. 
So unlike reflection where the two angles were equal, in this case, the two angles will not be equal. They will always be different. Unless, of course, there is no change in the index of refraction between these two materials, at which point the light would be just one material and the light would continue onward as normal. So if there is any difference, we can give that by Snell's law. And Snell's law relates this, that the index of refraction times the sine of the angle of uh, times the sine of the angle is equal to the index of refraction of the second material times the sine of that angle. And in this case, we could look at n1 times the sine of theta 1 is equal to n2 times the sine of theta 2. So we need a little bit more here to do these calculations. We need to be able to look at the angles and calculate those. So if we know, for example, the two indices of refraction, and we know one of the angles, say the incident angle here, then we can calculate the refracted angle. Again, it's a little bit more work because it involves a little bit of trigonometry, and we're not going through a great de deal of that in this class. So but but knowing that Snell's law and how it works is something that is very important. Now the other thing and we want to finish up with here is looking at another case of reflection and this is related to the two uh, total internal reflection. And this occurs when material is completely reflected within a material and it has at, a, at any boundary inside some light is reflected and some is refracted. So we look up here as the light comes in it's incident. Some of it is reflected back and remember these two angles are going to be the same. That is our law of reflection and this one is refracted at a different angle much further away. So it has sped up quite a bit as it crosses the boundary which tells us something about the density of the materials. Now what we find is that as you adjust this angle there is what we call a critical angle theta with the subscript C and at that point material I'm sorry light strikes this but now the angle of refraction becomes 90 degrees. Once it is 90 degrees no light is escaping out into this medium so no light is traveling out here and we get total refraction at reflection. So everything is reflection inside this. So in this case, we have the reflection at the critical angle. And for anything greater than that critical angle, everything is now reflected. So for anything greater than this critical angle, what, at which point the reflection is 90 degree refraction is 90 degrees, all of the light is reflected. And this is what we call total internal reflection where no light travels out into the other substance. So let's go ahead and finish up here with our summary. And what we've looked at is that we can use geometric optics to describe what happens to light. And what we found was that there were two laws. We had the law of reflection, which said that the angle of incidence uh, is equal to the angle of reflection. So these two angles are always the same when things are reflected. In terms of reflection, refraction, we came up with Snell's law, which said that n1 times the sine of the first angle was equal to n2, the index of refraction of the second object, times the sine of the refracted angle. And that was given by Snell's law here. And then finally, we finished up looking at total internal reflection occurs when the angle of the ray is greater than some critical angle theta subscript C. That is just enough that all of the light is is reflected at the boundary and none of it is refracted out of the substance. So that concludes this lecture on optics talking about reflection and refraction. We'll be back again next time for another topic in physical science. So until then, have a great day everyone, and I will see you in class.